Hello everybody, this is Dave Vellante. Welcome back to SuperCloud 2, where we're exploring the intersection of data, analytics, and the future of cloud. In this segment, we're going to look at how the SuperCloud will support a new class of applications. Not just work that runs on multiple clouds, but rather a new breed of apps that can orchestrate things in the real world. Think Uber for many types of businesses. These applications, they're not about codifying forms or business processes. They're about orchestrating people, places, and things in a business ecosystem. And I'm pleased to welcome my colleague and friend, George Gilbert, former Gartner analyst, Wikibon market analyst, former equities analyst as my co-host. And we're thrilled to have Tristan Handy, who's the founder and CEO of DBT Labs, and Bob Muglia, who's the former president of Microsoft's enterprise business and former CEO of Snowflake. Welcome all, gentlemen. Thank you for coming on the program. Be here. Thanks for having us. Hey, look, I'm going to start actually with SuperCloud uh, because you, both Tristan and Bob, you've read the definition. Thank you for doing that. And Bob, you, you have some really good input on some thoughts on, on maybe some of the drawbacks and how we can advance this. So what are your thoughts in reading that definition and around SuperCloud? Well, I, I thought, first of all, that, that you did a very good job of laying out all of the characteristics of it and, and helping to define it overall. But I do think we can be tightened a bit, and I think it's helpful to, to do it in as, as short a way as possible. And so um, in the last day, I've spent a little time uh, thinking about how to take it and, and, and write a crisp definition. And here's, here's my go at it. It was one day old, so, so give me a break if, it, if it's going to change. And of course, we have to follow the industry and, so that if, and whatever the industry decides. But let's give this a try. So in the way I think you're defining it, uh, what I would say is a super cloud is a platform that provides programmatically consistent services hosted on heterogeneous cloud providers. Boom, nice. Okay, great. I'm going to go back and read the script on that one and, and tighten that up a bit. Thank you for spending the time thinking about that. <laughs> Tristan, would you add anything to that? Or what are your thoughts on the whole super cloud concept? Um, so as I read through this, I. I fully realize that we need a word for this thing because um, I have experienced the inability to talk about it as well. But for many of us who have been living in the confluent snowflake, uh, you know, th this, this world of like new infrastructure, um, this seems fairly uncontroversial. Like I read through this and I'm just like, yeah, this is like the world I've been living in for, for years now. And I noticed, noticed that you called out Snowflake for, for being an example of this, but I think that there are like many folks, myself included, for whom this world like fully exists today. Yeah, I think that's a fair, I don't know if it's a criticism, but people have observed, well, what's the big <laughs> deal here? It's just kind of what we're living in today. It reminds me of, you know, Tim Berners-Lee saying, well, this is what the internet was supposed to be. It was supposed to be web 2.0. So <laughs> maybe, maybe this is what multi-cloud was supposed to be. Let's turn our attention to, to apps. Bob first and then go to Tristan. Bob, what are data apps to you when people talk about data products? Is, is that what they mean? Are we talking about something more different? What are data apps to you? Well, to understand data apps, it's useful to, to contrast them to something. And, and I just use the simple term people apps. Um, I know that's a little bit awkward, but it, it, it's, it's clear. And almost everything we work with, almost every application that we're familiar with, be it email or Salesforce or any consumer app, those are applications that are targeted at responding to people. You know, in contrast, a data application reacts to changes in data and uses some set of analytic services, services to autonomously take action. So where applications that we're familiar with respond to people, data apps respond to changes in data. And they both do something, but they do it for different reasons. Got it. You know, George, you and I were talking um, about, you know, it comes back to super cloud, broad definition, narrow definition. Uh, uh, Tristan, how, how do you see it? Um, do, do you see it the same way? Do you have a different take on, on data apps? Oh, geez, this is like a, a conversation that I don't know has an end. It's like been, I, I write a Substack and there's like this little community of people who all write Substacks and we argue with each other about these kinds of things. Like, there's, you know, as many different uh, takes on this question as you can, you can find. But um, the, the way that I think about it is that um, data, data products are atomic units of functionality that uh, are, are fundamentally data-driven in nature. So uh, a, a data product 
is it can be as simple as um, an interactive dashboard that, that is like actually had design thinking put into it and, and uh, serves a particular user group and has like actually gone through kind of the product development life cycle. Um, and the, the, then a data app or data application is, is a uh, kind of cohesive end-to-end -end experience that often encompasses like many different data, data products. Um, so, so from my perspective there, um, this is very, very related to um, the way that these things are produced, the kinds of experiences that they're provided. That like data, data innovates every product that we've been building in, you know, software engineering for for you know as long as there have been computers. You know, Jamak Degani oftentimes uses the, you know, she doesn't name Spotify, but I think it's Spotify as that kind of example she uses. But I wonder if we can maybe try to take some examples. If we take, if you take like, George, if you take a CRM system today, you're inputting leads, you got opportunities, it's driven by humans, they're really inputting the data, and then you got the system that kind of orchestrates the business process, like runs a forecast. But in, in this data-driven future, are we talking about the app itself pulling data in and automatically looking at data from the transaction systems, the call center, the, the supply chain, and, and then actually building a plan. George, is that how you see it? I, I go back to the example of Uber. May not be the most sophisticated data app that we build now, but it was like one of the first where you do have users interacting with their devices as, as riders trying to call a, a car or a driver. But the app then looks at the location of all the drivers in proximity and it matches a driver to a rider. It calculates an ETA to the rider. It calculates an ETA then to the destination and it calculates a price. Those are all activities that are done sort of autonomously that don't require a human to type something into a form. The, the application is using changes in data to calculate an analytic product and then to operationalize that, to assign the driver, to you know, calculate a price. Those are that's an example of what I would think of as, as a data app. And and um my question then, I guess, for Tristan is if we don't have the all the pieces in place for sort of mainstream companies to build those sorts of apps easily yet, like how would we get started? What What's the role of a semantic layer in making that easier for mainstream companies to build? And, and how do we get started, you know, say with, with metrics? How does that, how does that take us down that path? So what we've seen over the past, I don't know, decade or so, uh, is that one of the most successful business models uh, in infrastructure is taking uh, hard things and rolling them up behind APIs. You take messaging, you take payments, whatever. And uh, you all of a sudden increase the capability of uh, kind of your your median application developer. Uh, and you say, you know, previously you were spending all your time being focused on how do you accept credit cards, how do you send SMS payments, and now you can focus on your business logic and just create the thing. Um, one of, interestingly, one of the things that we still don't know how to API-ify is concepts that live inside of your data warehouse, inside of your data lake. Um, these are core concepts that, uh, you know, you would imagine that the business uh, would be able to create applications around very easily. But in fact, that's not the case. It's, it's actually quite challenging to, uh, and involves a lot of data engineering, pipelining, all this work to uh, make these available. And so if, if you really want to make it very easy to create some of these data experiences for, for users, um, you need to have an ability to describe these metrics and then to turn them into APIs to make them accessible to application developers who have literally no idea how they're calculated behind the scenes and they don't need to. So how rich can the that API layer grow if you start with metric definitions that, that you've defined? And DBT has, you know, the... The, the the metric, the dimensions, the time grain, things like that. That's a a well scoped sort of API that people can work within. How much can you extend that to say non calculated business rules or um, governance um, information like uh, like uh, data reliability 
uh, rules, things like that, or even uh, you know features for an um, AI ML uh, feature store. In other words, how how it it starts? You started pragmatically, but how far can you grow? Bob is uh, waiting with bated breath for us to answer this question. <laughs> I'm I'm just really quickly. Um, I I think that uh, we as a company and DBT as a product tend to be very pragmatic. We try to release the simplest possible version of a thing, uh, get it out there, and and see people use it. Um, but but the idea that um, the, the the concept of a metric is is really just a, a first landing pad. Um, the really the there is a uh, physical manifestation of the data, and then there's a logical manifestation of the data. And what we're trying to do here is uh, make it very easy to access the logical manifestation of the data. And a metric is a way to look at that. Maybe an entity, a customer, a, a user is an, is another way to to look at that. And I'm sure that there will be more kind of logical structures as well. So Bob, chime in on this. Is, you know, what, what's your thoughts on the right architecture behind this and, and how, how do we get there? Yeah, well, first of all, I think one of the ways we get there is by what companies like, Trist, like DBT Labs and Tristan is doing, which is incrementally taking and building on the modern data stack and extending that to add a semantic layer that, that, that describes the data. Now, the way I tend to think about this is, is a fairly major shift in the way we think about writing applications, which is today a code first approach to moving to a world that is model driven. And I think that's what the big change will be, is that, we, is that where today we think about data, we think about writing code, and we use that to produce APIs, as Tristan said, which encapsulates those things together in some form of services that are useful for organizations. And that, that idea of that encapsulation is never going to go away. It's a very, that, that concept of an API is incredibly useful and, and will exist well into the future. But what I think will happen is that in the next 10 years, we're going to move to a world where organizations are defining models, first of their data, but then ultimately of their business process, their entire business process. Now, the concept of a model-driven world is a very old concept. I mean, I first started thinking about this and, and, and playing around with some early model-driven tools, probably before Tristan was born in the early 1980s. And, and uh, uh, those tools didn't work because the semantics associated with executing the model uh, were too complex to be written in anything other than a procedural language. We're now reaching a time where that is changing. And you see it everywhere. You see it, first of all, in the world of machine learning and machine learning models, which are taking over more and more of what applications are doing. And I think that's an incredibly important step and learned models are an important part of what people will do. But if you look at the world today, um, I will claim that we've always been modeling. Um, modeling has existed in computers since there have been uh, integrated circuits and any form of computers. But what we do is what I would call implicit modeling, um, which means that it's the model is written on a whiteboard, it's in a bunch of Slack messages, it's on a set of napkins and conversations that happen and during Zoom. That's where the model gets defined today. It's implicit. There is one in the system. It is hard coded inside application logic that exists across many applications with humans being the, uh, the, the glue that connects those models together. And, and really there is no central place you can go to understand the full attributes of the business, all of the business rules, all of the business logic, the business data. That's gonna change in the next 10 years. And we'll start to have a world where, where, where we can define models about what we're doing. Now in the short run, the most important models to build are data models and, and, and to, to describe all of the attributes of the data and their relationships. And that's work that DBT Labs is doing. A number of other companies are doing that. We're taking steps along that way with catalogs. People are trying to build more complete ontologies associated with that. The underlying infrastructure is still super, super nascent. Um, but what I think we'll see is this, this infrastructure that exists today that's building learned models in the form of machine learning programs, you know, some of these incredible uh, 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 machine learning programs in foundation models like GPT and Dolly and all of the things that are happening in these global scale models. 
But also all of that needs to get applied to the domains that are appropriate for a business. And I think we'll see the infrastructure developing for that, that can take this concept of learned models and put it together with more explicitly defined models. And this is where the concept of knowledge graphs come in and then the technology that underlies that to actually implement and execute that, which I believe are relational knowledge graphs. Oh, oh, wow, there's a lot to unpack there. So let me ask the Columbo question. Tristan, we've been making fun of your youth. We're just, we're just jealous. Columbo, uh, I'll explain it offline maybe. I uh, like Columbo. Uh, okay, all right, good. So, but today, if you think about the application stack and the data stack, which is largely an analytics pipeline, they're separate, do they, those worlds, do they have to come together in order to, uh, to achieve Bob's vision? When I talk to practitioners about that, they're like, well, I don't want to complexify the application stack because the data stack today is so you know, hard to, to, to manage. But, but do those worlds have to come together and you know, through that model, I guess, abstraction or translation that Bob was just describing. How do you guys think about that? Who, who wants to take that? I think it's inevitable that um, data and AI are going to become closer together. I think that the, um, the infrastructure there has been moving in that direction for a long time. Uh, whether you want to use the lake house portmanteau or uh, or not, um, the there's also um, there's a next generation of uh, data tech that is is still in the, the like early stage of, of being developed. Um, there's a there's a company that I love that that is essentially cross cloud lambda. Um, and it, it's just a wonderful abstraction for, for computing. Um, so I, I, I think that, um, you know, people have been predicting that these worlds are going to come together for a while. Um, A6, A16Z wrote a, a great uh, post on this back in, I think, 2020, predicting this, and I've been predicting this since, since 2020, but um, it's, it, what's not clear is the timeline, but I think that uh, this is still just as inevitable as it's, as it's been. Who's that me that does follow up on? Who does? Who's that, Tristan? That does cross cloud lambda? Can you name names? Oh, they're, they're called they're called modal labs. Modal labs, yeah, of course. All right, go ahead, George. Let me ask about this this vision of of trying to put the semantics or the the code of the, that represents the business with the data. Um, it gets us to a world that's sort of more data centric, where data is not locked inside or behind the APIs of different applications so that we don't have silos. But at the same time, Bob, I've heard you talk about um, building the semantics gradually on top of, um, in, into a knowledge graph that maybe grows out of a data catalog. And the, the vision of, of getting to that point, essentially the enterprise's metadata and, and then the semantics are gonna add onto it are really stored in something that's separate from the underlying operational and analytic data. So at the same time then, why couldn't we gradually build semantics beyond the metric definitions that DBT has today? In other words, you build more and more of the semantics in some layer that DBT defines, and that sits above the data management layer, but any requests for data have to go through the DBT layer. Is that a, a workable alternative or where, what type of limitations would you face? Well, I think that it, it is the way the world will evolve is to start with the modern data stack and, you know, which is operational applications going through a data pipeline into some form of data lake, data warehouse, the lake house, whatever you want to call it. And then, you know, this wide variety of analytic services that are built together to, to the point that Tristan made about about uh, machine learning and data coming together. You see that in every major uh, data cloud provider. Snowflake certainly now supports Python and Java. Uh, Databricks is, is of course building their data warehouse. Uh, certainly Google, Microsoft and Amazon are doing very, very similar things in terms of building complete solutions that bring together an analytics stack that typically supports languages like Python together with, with the, the data stack and the data warehouse. I mean, all of those things are going to evolve and, and they're not going to go away because that infrastructure is, is, is relatively new. It's just being deployed by companies and it so solves the problem of working with petabytes of data if you need to work with petabytes of data and, and nothing will do that for a long time. What's missing 
is a is a layer that that understands and can 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 model the semantics of all of this. And if you need to, if you want to model all, if you want to talk about all of the semantics of of even data, you need to think about all of the relationships. You need to think about how these things connect together. And unfortunately, there really is no platform today. None of our our existing platforms are ultimately sufficient for this. It was interesting. I was just talking to a customer yesterday, uh, you know, a large financial organization that is is building out these semantic layers. They're further along than many companies are. And you know, I asked what they're building it on, and 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 you know, it's not surprising they're using a, a they're using combinations of of some form of search together with text, you know, textual based search together with uh, a, a document oriented database. In this case, it was Cosmos, um, and that really is kind of the state of the art right now. And and yet those 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 products were not built for this. Um, they don't really they can't manage the complicated relationships that are required. They can't issue the queries that are required. And so a new generation of database needs to be developed. And fortunately, you know, that, that is happening. The world is developing a new set of relational algorithms that will be able to work with hundreds of different relations. If you look at a, a SQL database like Snowflake or, or a, a BigQuery, you know, you get tens of different joins coming together and that query is gonna take a really long time. Well, fortunately, technology is evolving, and it's possible with new join algorithms, uh, a worst case optimal join algorithms, they're called, where you can join hundreds of different relations together and run semantic queries that you simply couldn't run. Now, that technology is nascent, um, but it's really important, and I think that will be a requirement to have uh, this semantic layer reach its full potential. In the meantime, Tristan can do a lot of great things by building up on what he's got today and solve some problems that are very real. But in the long run, I think we'll see a new, a new set of databases to support these models. So Tristan, you got to respond to that, right? You got you got to, so take the example of Snowflake. We know it doesn't deal well with complex joins, but they're, they've got big aspirations. Uh, they, they they're building an ecosystem to really solve some of these problems. Tristan, you guys are part of that ecosystem and others, but, but please, uh, your thoughts on what Bob just shared. Bob, I'm curious if, are, uh, I, I would have no idea what you were talking about, except that you introduced me to somebody who gave me a demo of a thing. And um, are, are, do you not want to go there right now? No, I can talk about it. I mean, we, we can talk about it. Look, the company I've been working with is, is Relational AI and they're doing, and they're doing this, this work to actually, first of all, work across the industry with, uh, with academics and, and research you know, across many, many different, over 20 different uh, research institutions across the world to develop this new set of algorithms. They're all fully published, just like SQL, the underlying algorithms that are used by SQL databases are. If you look, if you look today, every single SQL database uses a similar set of, alg of relational algorithms underneath that. And those algorithms actually go back to system R and what IBM developed in the, 19, in the 1970s. Um, we're just, there's an opportunity for us to build something new that allows you to take, for example, instead of taking data and grouping it together in tables, treat all data as individual relations, you know, a key and a set of, and a set of values, and then be able to perform purely relational operations on it. If you go back to what, 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 to, to Cod and, and what he wrote, he defined two things. He defined a relational calculus and a relational algebra. And essentially SQL is a, is a query language that is translated by the query processor into relational algebra. It's, but however, the, the calculus of, 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 of SQL is not even close to the full semantics of, of, of the relational mathematics. And it's possible to have systems that can, use, can do everything and that can store all of the attributes of the data model or ultimately the business model in a form that is much more natural to work with. So the here's here's like my my short answer to this. I think that we're dealing in different timescales. Um, I think that uh, I think that there is actually a tremendous amount of work to do in the semantic layer using the kind of technology that we have on the ground today. And I think that there's I don't know, let's say five years of like really solid work that that there is to do for for the entire industry, if not if not more. Um, and, but the wonderful thing about DBT is that it's independent of what the compute substrate is. 
beneath it. And so if we develop new platforms, new capabilities um, to, to describe semantic models in, in more fine-grained detail, more procedural, um, then we're, we're going to support that too. And so I'm, I'm excited about all of it. Yeah, so interpreting Let that me... short answer, you're basically saying, because Bob was just kind of pointing you, it's incremental, but you're saying, yeah, okay, we're applying it for incremental uh, use cases today, but we can accommodate a much broader set of examples in the future. Is that correct, Tristan? Uh, I think you're using the word incremental as if it's uh, not good, but I, I think that incremental is, is great. Um, we have always been about uh, applying uh, incremental improvement on top of uh, what what exists today, but but allowing practitioners to um, to uh, like use different workflows to to uh, actually make use of that technology. So yeah, yeah. we we are a very incremental company. We're going to continue being that way. Well, I think Bob was using incremental as a pejorative. I, I mean, I but to your point, a lot, no, a, a I don't lot think of so. Oh, I want to stop that. No, I don't think <laughs> okay. it's pejorative at all. I, well, I I I think incremental incremental is usually the most successful path. Yes, right? of course. My <laughs> we agree. We agree having, on that. Having yeah. tried many many moonshot things in my Microsoft days. I can tell you that that being incremental is a good is a good thing, and and I'm a very big believer that that that's the way the world's going to go. I just think that there is a need for us to build something new, and that ultimately that will be the solution. Now you can argue whether it's two years, three years, five years, or ten years, but I'd be shocked if it didn't happen. Yeah. So we all agree that that in incremental is less disruptive. Boom. But but Tristan, you're you're I think. I'm inferring that you believe you have the architecture to accommodate Bob's vision. And, and then oh, Bob, I'm, uh, and I'm inferring from Bob's comments that maybe you don't think that's the case, but please. No, no, I think that, so Bob, let me put words in your mouth and you tell me if, if you disagree. <laughs> um, DBT is completely useless in a world where a large scale cloud data warehouse doesn't exist. Um, we were not able to bring the power of Python to our users until these platforms started supporting Python. Like DBT is a, uh, is a layer on top of uh, large scale computing platforms. And to the extent that those platforms extend their functionality to bring more capabilities, we will also surface those capabilities. Let me try well, well, yeah, so, so, so Bob, the two. Bob, Bob, do, do, do you, you concur with what Tristan Absolutely. just said? Absolutely. I mean, there's nothing to argue with in what Tristan just said. I, I, mean, I wanted. And, and it's what he's doing. It'll continue to, I believe he'll continue to do it. And I think it's a very good thing for the indus, in, in industry. You know, I'm just simply saying that, that, that on top of that, I would like to provide Tristan and all of those who are following similar paths to him with a new type of database that can actually solve these problems in a much more architected way. And when I talk about Cosmo, with something like Mongo or Cosmos together with Elastic, you're using Elastic as the join engine, okay? That's the, the purpose of it. It becomes a, a poor man's join engine. And I kind of go, I know there's a better answer than that. I know there is. Um, but that's kind of where we are state of the art right now. George, we got to wrap us. So g g give us the last, last word here. Go ahead, George. Okay, I just, I think there's a way to tie together what, what Tristan and Bob are both talking about and I want them to validate it, which is for five years, we're going to be adding or some number of years, more and more semantics to the operational and analytic data that we have, starting with metric definitions. My question is for Bob, as, dbt accumulates more and more of those semantics for different enterprises can that layer not run on top of a relational knowledge graph and what would we lose by not having by having the knowledge graph store sort of the joins all the complex relationships among the data but having the semantics in the dbt layer well i think this okay i think first of all the that that dbt will be an environment where many of these semantics are defined. The question we're asking is how are they stored and how are they processed? And what I predict will happen is, is that over time, as, as companies like DBT begin to build more and more richness into their semantic layer, they will begin to experience challenges that customers want to run queries, they want to, they want to ask questions, they want to use this for things where the underlying infrastructure becomes a, an obstacle. 
I mean, this has happened in always in the history, right? I mean, I, you see major advances in, in, in computer science when the data model changes. And, and I think we're, in the, we're on the verge of a very significant change in the way data is stored and structured, or at least metadata is stored and structured. Again, I'm not saying that, that any time in the next 10 years, SQL is gonna go away. In fact, more SQL will be written in the future than has been written in the past. And that, those, those platforms will mature to become the engines, the, the, the slicer dicers of data. I mean, that's what they are today. They're incredibly powerful at working with large amounts of data and that infrastructure is maturing very rapidly. What is not maturing is the infrastructure um, to handle all of the metadata and the semantics that that requires. And that's where I say knowledge graphs are what I believe will be the solution to that. But Tristan, bring us home here. It, it sounds like, let me put, posit this, is that whatever happens in the future, we're going to leverage the, the vast system that has become cloud that we're talking about a super cloud, sort of where data lives, irrespective of physical location, we're going to have to tap that data. Uh, it's not necessarily going to be in one place, but, but give us your final thoughts, please. 100% agree. I think that the data is going to live everywhere. It is the responsibility for uh, both the metadata systems and the, the data processing engine themselves to make sure that we can uh, join data across uh, cloud providers, that we can join data across um, different fiscal uh, regions, um, and that we as practitioners are going to kind of start uh, forgetting about details like that. And, and we're going to start thinking more about how we want to arrange our teams, how does the tooling that we use support our team structures. And um, that's that's when data mesh, I think, really starts to, to get very, very critical as a concept. Guys, great conversation. It was really awesome to have you. I can't thank you enough for, for spending time with us. Really appreciate it. Thanks a lot. All right, this is Dave Vellante for George Gilbert, John Furrier, and the entire CUBE community. Keep it right there for more content. You're watching SuperCloud 2.